Amen. How many come to magnify the name of Jesus Christ? That's cute, but how many really come to magnify the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? He is sovereign over all creation. He should be exalted in every nation. There is not a place that God doesn't have jurisdiction over. I love him because, you know, he, he, he's not just a king. He's a king of kings and he's not voted in. He can't be voted out. He can't be impeached. But we serve a God that has, has a throne that is everlasting. And I'm grateful to serve that God. Well, good to be here. Good to be gathered with God's people worshiping. And praising our great God and our King, Jesus Christ. Welcome to our first time visitors. If you're here for the first time, uh, I know we already came around. Amen. Let's welcome them. Man, grateful for our first time visitors. Uh, there, there are many churches that you passed to get here today. Uh, I, there are some intersections in, Bur in, in Brooklyn where there's four churches on each corner. This is literally the borough of Brooklyn, uh, the borough of churches. And so you being here today uh, means that you had options, but you chose to come here. And we, we really are. We want to make a big deal over that. 680 churches in Brooklyn, 52 different denominations. Uh, and you made your way through all of those to get here. And so we honor you. And if you don't have to rush out, we love to hear your story. What you think people don't care about and don't want to hear, we actually do care about. We do want to hear. So if you don't have to rush out, we'd love to get to meet you a little bit. Well, let's get into the word of God. Y'all all right this morning? God gave us some sun. Yes. Somebody said, thank you, Lord. Get to Romans chapter four. That's where we'll be. Uh, shout out to all of our graduates. If you graduated over the last couple of weeks. Man, did anybody in this service graduate over the last couple of weeks? Anybody? Anybody? A couple people. Amen. Amen. We want to honor you. We, we realize the work that you had to put in to get that degree. Salvation is by faith, but degrees are by works. You got it. You got to work for that degree. And we, we had people that have graduated. I saw on, on Instagram some, some of our members have graduated from uh, Anu graduated. She's a doctor now. Y'all call her Dr. Anu. Amen. And so, uh, and, and um, Devon, the great theologian, graduated from Moody Bible Institute. Amen. <clears throat> He actually had a, he had a, a multiple degree. He got his degree in Bible, but he also did some culinary work. And so he can preach and cook at the same time. That's a good brother right there. That's somebody you should know. He can preach your soul happy, but he also can cook afterwards. And that's, that's a good brother to know. Well, listen, uh, before we dig in, a quick, 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 very quick announcement. Uh, all of our men, all of our brothers, if you are a member here, if you're a covenant member here, or if you're moving towards membership, you, you've been coming and, and this is what you would call church, this is what you would call home, I simply want to meet with you for two seconds, literally, not two, maybe two minutes, right here on my left. If you could all just come up here, we will not be long, it will not take us long, I just got to communicate something that's on my heart, But so I, I need all the brothers to meet me. Uh, right here. All right, let's dig in. Paul is here as well from London. We love Paul. Got to spend some time here, a, a year doing a program, and uh, we fell in love with him from the first time he started coming here, jumped right in, started serving, started singing on the worship team, and we were sad to see him leave, but it's good to have him back. He surprised us and popped in. All right, Romans chapter four, we've been going through a sermon series on the book of Romans, and uh, it, it's, been, it's been good, it's been refreshing. Paul started to pick up on a theme over the last couple of weeks, and this theme is that we are justified by faith alone in Christ, and uh, we, we call this theme on God, meaning our justification, our redemption, our salvation is all on God, and uh, that, that's a beautiful thing. We tried to highlight that if it's not on God, then it's on us. And if it's on us, it's an unbearable weight. It's impossible. You're not able to live up to the standard that God is calling us to because the standard is never good. It's always perfect. And none of us in this room are perfect. And so that theme of, of, of on, God, on, on God is something that we tried to highlight because Paul gets really, really redundant over the next couple of chapters. This idea of on God, this, this theme is really a cultural term. And we wanted to redeem that cultural term and, and, and try to communicate to you what salvation should look like by using a culturally relevant term. Does that make sense? So we're going to talk about today how uh, all of our life should be on God. Let's dig into the text. If you could meet me in verse 9. <clears throat> 
Verse 9 says this. Is this blessing only for the circumcised then? Or is it also for the uncircumcised? For we say faith was credited to Abraham for righteousness. In what way was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? It was not while he was circumcised, but uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness that, had, that, had, that he had by faith while still uncircumcised. This was to make, the, make him the father of all who believed, but are not circumcised, so that righteousness may be credited to them also. And he became the father of the circumcised who are not only circumcised, but also who follow in the footsteps of their faith of the faith of their father, Abraham, while he was still uncircumcised. We'll make sense of that in a minute. Verse 13. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would inherit the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. If those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made empty. And the promise nullified. Please underline verse 15. Because the law produced wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. This is why the promise is by faith, so that it may be according to grace. Not guarantee, not guarantee to, all of, to, to all of the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also those who are of Abraham's faith. He is the father of all of us. As it is written, he's quoting Genesis 15, I have made you the father of many nations. He is our father in God's sight, in whom Abraham believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things into existence that do not exist. He believed, hoping against hope, so that he became the father of many nations according to what, he, what had been spoken so will your descendants be. Look at verse 19. I love this. He did not weaken in his faith when he considered his own body to already be dead since he was about 100 years old. And also the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver in unbelief at God's promise, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God because he was fully convinced, not partially, fully convinced that what God had promised he was able to do. Therefore, it was credited to him for righteousness. Now it was credited to him uh, was not written uh, for Abraham alone, but also for us. It will be credited to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. He was delivered up for our trespasses and raised up for our justification. I want to preach today from the topic entitled Living Life on God. Living Life on God. Let's look to the Lord fully dependent on him. Uh, Father, we come to you now knowing that without you, uh, our time together is in vain. If you don't open our eyes so that we may behold the wondrous things out of your law, Father, we will be lost. And so may this moment not just be an information transfer, but may this be a heart change transformation. A word that can not just take us through the week from Sunday to Sunday to Sunday to Sunday, but something that transforms our decisions and how we do life. So, Father, would you meet us today in your words? Speak to us right out of what you've already spoken through your Apostle Paul. It's in Christ's name we give all glory. Let everybody say amen. amen. Living life on God. My family has a, a pretty consistent routine in the mornings. Every morning we do, at least Monday through Friday, as we're preparing to get out and get into the world, there's a consistent routine that we have. Uh, we usually get time together where it's nothing deep, nothing long, but we'll get time together where we get into the word. And so we'll do a small devotional, something that uh, is, is, is triggered by circumstances of life, something that we're going through, or the boys going through. We'll all get around the word of God. And right after that, and I, my wife and I aren't the only ones that lead that. Sometimes the boys will lead our devotional time. And then right after that, we'll move into a quick time of prayer. And uh, that's almost like the huddle is broken at that point. Once we pray, we know it's time to go ahead and get out and to the world. And when the boys are leaving out, they typically leave first. And when they're leaving out, Ty has a consistent saying that she says every time they're about to leave out. She says, the decisions that you make today will affect your life tomorrow. 
In the beginning, it was just something that was on her heart that she uh, wanted to say, but now it's become the redundancy of it, the repetitive nature, the routine has made it a part of our lives. So now when I make decisions, I'm going, okay, this decision is going to affect my life tomorrow. Why? Because it was redundant. And there's something good about redundancy. There's something good about hearing the same thing over and over and over and over again. And that is what you get today in the text. Paul ain't saying nothing new. Everything Paul says today, he said last week. And everything he said last week, he said the week before. We talked about how Paul talks about how we are, are justified by faith alone, through grace alone, and Christ alone. That's essentially what he is saying today. I started to email the tech team and ask them to just play the sermon from last week. And I was just going to kind of act it out because... Paul is saying pretty much the same thing, but as your pastor and a consistent preacher here at this local church, I have a deep conviction to always take even the redundancies of scripture and make it applicable. My goal is never to preach uh, something with deep complexity and to preach it with complexity, but I, also, I want to preach it to where it's simple, to where you walk out. The one point that you get every sermon is that, is that Jesus is Lord and I want to put my hope in him. That's the goal of our time together. That's the goal of uh, at least how I communicate. And, you know, one of the things I didn't want to do today was just focus on just salvation. Don't hear me in saying that that's not important. I don't want to just focus on what ha happens at the moment you get saved, but I want to focus us today on what happens after you get saved. What does life look like after you get saved? What does sanctification, you keep throwing that word out, what does sanctif sanctification practically look like in my life? What, what does life look like with me wrestling with sins? Because you do know you don't meet Jesus and then all your sins just go away. You still got issues. And so what do I do with all of my issues? How do I confess my issues and, and how do I live life? And even though I might overcome sin, I'm still in the presence of sin. So what does life look like? What am I supposed to be doing? And I think Paul today will answer some of those questions for us. Some of the questions that you have about life can be found right in the word of God. And y'all know we'll say the, the Bible is a road map to life. I, I don't know. I mean, it literally does have maps in it, so maybe. But, but at the end of the day, the question we should be asking is, how can the word of God that is written years and years and years ago, how can it be applicable in my life? And Paul is going to answer that today. I have three points and three points only. I'll get you out of here soon. So you, if y'all talk back a little bit, y'all say amen. I'll get you out of here quicker. So y'all can get to brunch because I know y'all want to do that because it's nice out. Three points. Here they are. Living life on God is not contingent on religion and rituals. That's the first point Paul's going to make. Second point he's going to make is when living life on God, you will often have to confront your sin. Third and final point that he's going to bring up is living life on God is not restrained by human limitations. That's our time together. Let's deal with the first one. Living life on God is not contingent upon Religion and rituals. Look at verse 9. It says, is this blessing only for the circumcised then? Or is it also for the uncircumcised? For we say faith was credited to Abraham for righteousness. In what way was it credited? Was it credited while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? uncircumcised? Is it not while he was circumcised? But it was not while he was circumcised, but uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, here it is, as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while still uncircumcised. Paul is like, listen, y'all have been so confused over the last few weeks. Remember last week he was like, you guys were confused on how Abraham was justified. Some of y'all were saying that he was justified by, by faith alone. And some of you guys are saying that he's justified or, or deemed righteous by faith plus works. And so Paul cleared it up for us last week. But this week he's not answering the question how he was justified. He's answering the question when he was justified. Was Paul, I mean, was, was Abraham justified while he was circumcised or before he was circumcised, because many people were saying that the only reason God accepted him was because he was circumcised. And Paul is like, listen, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to treat y'all like Ayana fixed my life. I'm going to have to set y'all straight because y'all have been so confused over the last few weeks. Paul is saying to us today that Abraham, the father of the faith, was not justified or deemed righteous 
be, uh, after he was circumcised, but before. In other words, in chapter 15 of Genesis, uh, of Genesis, you see Abraham being deemed as righteous. The Bible says that God takes him outside and say, look up at the stars. He looks up at the stars and he says, your descendants will outnumber the stars. And the Bible says that he believed God. And because he believed God, he was deemed as righteous. But then he's not circumcised yet. He doesn't get circumcised until Genesis 17. Why is that important? Because between Genesis 15 and Genesis 17 is 24 years. 24 years between him being deemed as righteous and him actually receiving the sign of uh, of, uh, of his righteousness, which was circumcision. And what Paul is doing is Paul is pulling away the ability for the church at Rome to lean on religious activity as a means of sanctification and salvation. And what is good for the church at Rome is good for you and I in this room. You and I cannot live life on God if we're living life on religion and rituals. And y'all know we do it. We, we don't try to just earn God's favor, but, you know, we get into a place where we become we become so self-sufficient that we want God to move on our behalf because we're so religious and we get entitled. God, you should move on. My, you saw how many times I came to church. You, you saw that I got baptized. And that's what we do. We lean on the symbols and not the substance. So in other words, we do stuff like. Listen, I just got to get baptized. I ain't got to believe if I can just get baptized, like there's something mystical in the water. There's nothing mystical in the water. It's cold tap water. That's what, and if it was something mystical in the water, I'd pack up that little blue uh, 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 pool that we use. I take it home and I bathe in it every night. But there's nothing mystical in the water because baptism is a symbol, not the substance. We do it with, with communion. And man, I had a hard week and I, I just fell off this week and I wasn't prayerful and I fell into a little bit of sin. So if I could just take communion this week, then me and the Lord are good. But it's a symbol of the cross. It is not belief. It's not the substance. We do that with the altar calls. If I can just get to the altar and repeat that prayer, if the pastor can just lay hands on me and transfer something. There ain't nothing being transferred. It's a symbol but it's not the substance. It's just like my marriage. You know, my my marriage is not the symbol of my marriage is this. Everybody know for, we were married for 17 years and everybody know that. Amen. Praise God. When I walk in the street, people know that I'm married and they know that I'm married because of the symbol. But if I lost this, I'm still married. Time might kick me out, but I'm still married. <laughs> Legally, I'm still married. And so this is just the symbol. And what we've done is we've traded the symbol with the substance. And we said, I'm maturing in my faith because I'm doing religious activity, because I'm doing rituals. And we do that with stuff beyond just church stuff. We live life on on health and wellness. So we were like, Lord, I can't get time with you. But as long as I can meditate, get into my place of Zen and hear me, I'm not taking your quiet time away. I'm not taking your 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 place of of Zen away. But if you replace prayer with meditation, something's not right. That's not living life on God. If you replace meditation with living life on with a living life on God, then something is not right. And I'm not talking about those meditations where we're meditating on the word. because You know, the word of God says in in, in uh, Psalm 100 to meditate on the word. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the when you hit the thing on boing, you go hum your non ring like that kind of stuff. We can't live life on God and live life on rituals and religion. We do it with I just found out about burning sage. Why y'all ain't tell me about this? I just found out that people literally clean out the negativity in their environment by burning sage. Lamique showed me a Instagram post of, of this guy named Jay, uh, what's his name? Versace. Jay Versace, I knew y'all following him. I seen you follow him, Imani. <laughs> Pastor be trolling, boy. Listen, I, I like him, I think he's funny, I think he's hilarious, but what he does is, he wants to clean out the negativity on his timeline, and so he'll burn sage and he'll like throw it around. With, he have one Bible in the hand and a cross and holy water and sage. <laughs> But you can't live life on God and live life on sage. 
Because it doesn't, it doesn't mix. We have to live life on God apart from anything else. And hear me, don't hear me say, don't clean your, uh, your environment of negativity. You might, like, there might be some toxic people around you. And you might need to clean that out. But what I'm saying is living life on God doesn't mean I can live life absent from depending on him. My greatest zen, my greatest place of peace is in the will of Christ. You hear me? Ephesians chapter 2 verse 14 tells me that he himself is our peace. So living life on God is living life dependent on the words of Jesus Christ, not just a whole bunch of rit ritualistic stuff. And that is what we do. We trade the substance for secondary stuff that are symbols. And we think we're maturing because we're doing a whole bunch of religious stuff, but that isn't what helps us to grow. And so point number one, living life on God means you cannot be contingent upon religion and rituals. Point number two, when living life on God, you will often have to confront your sin. Did you know that? Living life on God means that you will have to interact with your sin at some point. Look at verse 15. Verse 15 says it says it well, because the law produced wrath and where there is no law, there is no transgression. I know that I fall short when I read the word of God. I know how far I am when I look at scripture. When I look at God's standard of holiness, I get to see how I fall short. And that doesn't lead me to despair. That leads me to Christ because Christ is able to fulfill the law. And what, what, what this shows us is that you have to deal with your sin at some point. Yeah. Notice I said your sin. Because we become really good at dealing with everybody else's sin. And we've, we've extended so much grace to ourselves, but we deal with everyone else in a harsh manner. So what, what, you're dealing, what you're doing is you're not dealing with your sin because you're too busy dealing with everybody else's sin. I love the way Paul says it. There's a verse tucked away in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, where Paul says, I beat my body into submission. Can you imagine that? But what we do is we take that verse and we put it on somebody else. And so we beat others' body into submission while we let ourselves run rampant. And it's dangerous. It's dangerous for you not to deal with your sin. Listen, I'm exhausted after I deal with my sin. I ain't got no time to gossip on your sin. I ain't got no time to talk about your sin. I ain't got time to look down on you. And what we do is we be like, bro, did you hear about that marriage? I'm like, I heard about it, but I'm too tired to gossip. I need to pray about it. Amen. Like, wouldn't it be wonderful if we stopped gossiping on others and went to God and gossiped on yourself? Wouldn't it be good if we went to God and be like, God, did you see me? Did you see what I did? Like, gossip on you. Don't gossip on others, but what we deal is we don't deal with our sin because we're too busy dealing with everybody else's sin. But at some point, you got to deal with your issues. And that literally means there needs to be uh, woven into your life a real sense of repentance. And I don't mean repentance as in, I'm sorry. I mean repentance as in turning away from that sin and going the other direction. But what we've done is we've become so numb to sin and you cannot live life on God and be numb to sin. But living life on God means that you are growing in your repentance. Before I was a believer, I sinned more and repented less. And after becoming a believer, I repent more and sin less. That doesn't mean I'm sinless. It means I sin less. And that is what we have to do when it comes to to our sin. You are going to have to deal with your issues. What the word of God does is the word of God is a mirror into the depravity of my heart. When I read the word of God, I see how I don't line up. I see dysfunction. I see inconsistencies. When, when I first got my license, I was a junior in high school. And the, the week I got my license, I planned that week. And now I said, Mom, can I borrow the car? She let me borrow the car. I said, I want to pick up all my friends and we go into the mall. You know, that's what we used to do in Jersey. And I got, got my friends in the car. and We were driving to the mall. It was getting dark outside. And as I was going through a light, the light was yellow. Uh, but apparently it turns red pretty quickly. And I didn't know that when I first started driving. And I get through the light and I see a camera flash. And I'm like, paparazzi following us? I didn't know what it was. But I found out two weeks later what it was. They sent that ticket. And what, what happened in that moment is I was a transgressor. I broke the law. And I only knew I broke the law because there was a picture of my license plate that was sent to me. And that's what the word of God does. 
When you read the word of God, it's giving you snapshots of your inconsistency. It's giving you pictures of how far you are from the Lord. But what we do is we ignore them. We read the word of God and we be like, oh, I'm killing it. I'm lining up. But in reality, who can be honest in this room and say, oftentimes I read stuff and I'm like, I'm not there yet. Can I go deeper? There are often times that I preach to you stuff that I'm still dealing with. If you think I'm, pre first of all, I'm setting the bar real low if I'm always preaching stuff that I've conquered. There are times I'm preaching stuff, I'm like, God, I can't preach that. I'm still dealing with it. And that's how you got to be in the place where you allow the word of God to read you, not you read it. You got to allow the word of God to get inside your heart and get into the crevices and the cracks and pull out the mess. But that's what the word of God does. How do I know? Because the Bible says where there is no law, there is no transgression. If you don't know the word, you don't know how far you fell. But when you read the word, you get introduced to the fact that you are actually a sinner. You don't just hear that on Sundays, but you're actually a sinner. Yeah. Yeah. Point number one, living life on God is not contingent on rules and rituals. Point number two, when living life on God, you will often have to confront your sin. Where there is no sin, there is no transgression. Point number three, living life on God is not restrained by human limitations. But let me tell you something. When it comes, when it comes to verses 19 to 21, there is something so rich that has to spark something in you. Look at what verse 19 says. He did not weaken in his faith when he considered his own body as already dead. Since he was about 100 years old and also the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver in unbelief. At God's promise, but was strengthened. Let me say that again. He was strengthened in his faith and he gave glory to God. Verse 21, because he was fully convinced that what God had promised, he was able to do. Woo! Like living life on God means that you trust the promises of God even when human limitations are met with God. They're in contradiction with the promise. When, when you live life on God, you, there are some things that, that you are impossible with men. When you look around at the situation, like, you know what he's talking about here? Let me go through the story. In this situation right here, he's talking about Abraham getting the promise of being a father of many nations and having descendants that outnumber the stars, but he ain't got a kid yet. Come on. Not only does he not have a, a son, but the Bible says his body is as good as dead. You know you old. When the Bible says your body is good as dead. It, it literally says he's almost 100 years old. But even if he was a young spring chicken, he, even if he was young and vibrant and, and ready to take on the world, his wife, the Bible says, has deadness in her womb. Two impossibilities. It should have been impossible for him to have one kid. But the Bible says he makes him the father of many nations. He exceeds the expectation that Abraham wanted. Abraham wanted one. God said, I'm going to give you a whole bunch. I'm going to give you so many that you're going to become the father of many nations. And I love this because Abraham isn't stagnant in his faith. The Bible says he's strengthened in his faith. And he gives glory to God. And God never called you to be a stagnant Christian. Where your faith is the same as it was when you first met God. Your faith should grow every day. When you see God moving the impossibilities out of your way, when you see God making dead things alive, because at the end of the day, God doesn't make good people better. He makes dead things alive. Do you see what this scripture said? That he opens up Sarah's womb. That he provides through Abraham the ability to be able to, he provides seed in him, even though he's old and dried up. Even though he's not able to have kids, God is like, I, and this is why I love God, because God always waits for all of the, the odds to be stacked against you. He waits for that. You know why he waits for that? Because if you can do it on your own, he gets no glory. But the moment he, you pull away all of the impossibilities and he says, I can, let me show you what I can do. I can call those things that are not as though they were. But y'all know what we do. We be like, let me speak those things that are not as though, you know the scripture says, God speaks those things. That are not as though they were. In other words, he looked at Sarah's womb and says, I know that's impossible. Life in her womb. He looks at Abraham and says, I know he's old and not able to have kids. Life in his body. And what is it that you are waiting for God to do that's impossible? 
What, what is it that the odds are stacked against you and you are waiting for the moment to God to open the door? Yes. He's able to speak life into that situation. And I don't know what it, maybe it's your marriage. Yeah. Maybe you, your marriage has been dying and you've been ready to give up. But when I read this, I realize God can bring life yeah. to your marriage. Yeah. Maybe it's a sickness. I can't promise that everybody's going to be in health and wealth. But I, what I will say is, I think we should pray as though we know he can do it. Because yeah. the Bible says he didn't waver in his faith. Yeah. And let me show you how Abraham's faith grew. Abraham did not just believe in Genesis 15 and then fall off in Genesis 16. But if you go seven more chapters, there's a there's a story in Genesis 22 that talks about how Abram finally gets a son. He's been waiting. God's promised something to him. He saw the stars and he said it's going to outnumber the stars. He's been waiting and he finally has Isaac. And when he has Isaac, God says, go up to Mount Moriah and kill him. Can you imagine this? He was waiting for this promise. He gets the promise and God says, now kill him. But he was so unwavering in his faith that he was willing to eat because he knew. Listen to me. He knew even though even though he's never seen a miracle, he's never seen a resurrection. He knew that even if he went through with what God told him to do, he knew that God would keep his promise. Yeah. And that he would raise his son from the dead. You know how I, I know this? Because he realizes that even though resurrection is impossible, he's never seen it. God lying is more impossible. Like, hear, hear this. Don't, don't miss this. Whatever it is in your life, as impossible as it is, God not keeping and fulfilling his promise is more impossible. Because all, God always comes through. If he said it, he can do it. If he promised it, he can bring it to pass. What are you waiting for God to do? What is it that that door that's closed that you need God to open up? By faith, we need to grow and be unwavering in our faith. You know, I love this story. I love this story of Abraham and Isaac because there's a connection to somebody else in the New Testament. The Bible says that God said, take your one and only son. There's somewhere else that the Bible says, I'm going to bring my one and only son. He also says, take him, look at this, put the wood on his back. Isaac puts wood on his back to go up to be sacrificed. There's somebody else in the New Testament that puts wood on his back to go up to Golgotha's hill. Then the Bible says that when he gets there, God demands that a sacrifice because he's so holy, he needs a sacrifice. But Isaac isn't the sacrifice. Don't miss this. There's a substitute there. God says, look over into the, into the thicket. There's a, there's a ram in the bush, and he goes and he grabs that sacrifice. And I love God because even though Isaac wasn't sacrificed, God still needed the sacrifice, and he provided the sacrifice. And this is what I love about Christ, that even though Christ was brutally murdered, I mean, he brutal, beat to shreds, he is your substitute. He is your sacrifice. The same way Abraham could look over to his right and see a ram in the bush, you and I can look to the cross and see what substitutes for your sin. And so when we talk about living life on God, for some of you, living life on God starts with faith in Jesus. Some of you haven't trusted in him. I know you haven't. Some of you, you you've been going through life and you've been stuck into religion and rituals, but you don't have genuine faith in Jesus. And we want to point you to the one that can save you. We want to point you to the one that brings life. When he talks about calling into existence the things that were dead, we want to point you to the one that has fulfilled that, which is Christ. And some of you have believed in Christ. And you've been walking with him for some time. And, but somewhere along the line, you didn't strengthen in your faith. You got weak in your faith. Did you read this text with me? It says in verse 19, he did not weaken in his faith. You go to verse number 20, it says, that, but he was strengthened and he gave glory to God. God wants, he's booby-trapped booby -trapped your life to bring him glory. Yeah. And, and so the, the, the impossible situations in your life are just moments for him to get the glory. The good in your life. We're celebrating graduations and weddings and some of you are pregnant and there's so many moments of celebratory uh, moments in your life. But here's what I know. He wants glory out of those moments. Yes. But what we've done is we've become glory hogs and glory thieves. But the scripture says as he was strengthened in his faith, he gave glory to God. 
What's impossible in your life that you are praying for God to do? Because I can't promise that it's going to happen. It's going to happen according to his will, whether I promise it or not. I can't say this is the month of, of great increase. I don't know. Maybe it's the month of decrease. And that might be a blessing. Father, I pray for everybody in this room. Somebody in here doesn't know you. Who's that young man? Who's that young lady? As we talk about the impossibility of situations, one of the things that's greatest, the greatest impossibility is for us to save ourselves. And so, Father, I pray, oh God, for the one that doesn't know you, that young lady that's come here because her friend invited her. The young man came here because he was promised lunch after church. I pray, oh God, for salvation today. Because all of us had to get to that point where we've trusted in you. All of our questions weren't answered. Everything didn't line up. For some of us, we've trusted in you. Things got worse. But even in those moments where things are worse and impossible and we've reached our wits in, in those moments, you get the greatest glory because if we could do it, Lord, we get the glory, but you get all glory out of everything we do. And so, Father, I pray, oh God, for new life in this room. I pray for redemption. I pray for regeneration. I pray for dead hearts to be made alive the same way Sarah's womb was made alive. I also pray for the one that does know you but just hasn't walked with you, hasn't, hasn't really trusted you, hasn't, they've been unwavering in their faith. I love what the New Testament says it. Lord, help our unbelief. Help the areas where we are struggling to trust you, whether it's financial, physical. I don't know what it is, but God, I pray that you would help us to grow in our faith. Tomorrow, may we have more faith than we do today. Tomorrow, may we lean on your promises more than we do today because you ain't never failed in keeping a promise. Our friends have failed us. Family has failed us. And if we're honest, we've failed us. But you have never failed us. You've never not kept a promise. God, you are faithful to us even when we aren't faithful to you. And so I pray, oh God, for the one that does know you but just hasn't walked with you and hasn't trusted you, Father. Help us to trust you more. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. I pray that this word would be hidden in our heart, that we would not sin against it. Later on this week, oh God, I pray that this verse would be reminded to somebody that we should be unwavering in our faith. We should be unwavering in our commitment to you. We should be unwavering in believing the promises that you make because we know that you're able to do it. And Father, help us to rest in the fact if you don't do it, it's not because you're not good. It's because you know us better than we know ourselves. Some stuff you don't give us, Lord, is a blessing. You don't only know 10 years from now, you're in 10 years from now. We sitting in this moment don't know what tomorrow brings, but you know what the rest of our lives bring. Give us what we need, take away what we don't. And help us to trust you in all of it. The ups and downs of life, help us to trust you because... You are good. Help us to live life, Lord. That's what I'm praying. Help us to live life dependent on you, not on ourselves. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.